Uh, welcome to the uh, lead-off batting session of the Tucson Book Festival. Uh, our session is called Emerging from the Shadows, Women in the Lives of Wilson, Jefferson, and Twain. Uh, I am Judy Temple. I teach in both the English department and in Gender and Women's Studies, and I will be your moderator for today. Uh, I sent the esteemed authors four questions to think about, and they are free to range widely or to answer some of these specifically. So I'll just go through them quickly. What was the most intriguing discovery you made about your biographical subjects? What were the challenges of balancing the women's lives against the more famous men to whom they were attached? What audience did you imagine reading your book, and how did this influence your writing? I bet they were thinking of a paying audience. Uh, and what is a mystery or question that still puzzles you about the woman or the women? So each of our authors has agreed to speak for eight minutes, which should leave us some active time for questions and answers. Okay. Uh, our first author is Christy Miller, who is a research fellow at the University of Arizona Southwest Center. She is the author of four books. Her enormously popular biography, Isabella Greenway, An Enterprising Woman, was followed by a volume of friendship, Letters Between Eleanor Roosevelt and Isabella Greenway. Today she'll be focusing on her latest book, Ellen and Edith, Woodrow Wilson's first ladies, although by my count, Edith would be Wilson's second first lady. <laughs> okay. Well, Judy, I was intrigued to discover that Woodrow Wilson and both his wives were completely different from what I imagined when I began the project. I'd seen pictures of Woodrow Wilson so I decided that he was probably cerebral and cold. I knew next to nothing at all about his first wife, so clearly she couldn't have been very important or interesting. <laughs> I'd heard plenty about Woodrow's second wife, Edith, most of it bad. She has a reputation as a power-hungry woman who was a secret woman president for 18 months. And I was wrong about all of these people. <laughs> As I began to research, I came to realize that Woodrow Wilson was a deeply passionate man. I discovered he had an eight-year intimate relationship with another woman during his first marriage. Now, I was surprised, but that was not really an intriguing discovery because it was not the first time a presidential candidate <laughs> had had that type of relationship in his background. No, the really intriguing discovery for me was that the importance of his two wives was pretty much the opposite of what I'd imagined. Ellen was far from a complete non-entity. She had a major influence on the first ladies of the 20th century. While Edith merely provided a cautionary example of the limits of a first lady's power. Ellen's future influence could not have been predicted from her early life. She came from a small town in rural Georgia after the Civil War. But she was a perfect partner for the ambitious young professor. She was unusually well-educated for a woman in her time and place. And she helped her husband with his studies. She learned German so that she could translate political monographs for him. She helped him with his speeches. She critiqued them. She provided apt quotations because she knew a lot of poetry. And with her help, Woodrow Wilson became a successful professor. He became president of Princeton University, governor of New Jersey. And finally, 100 years ago, he was elected president of the United States. So in 1913, Ellen Wilson found herself in the White House. Now, this was not a place that she ever imagined she would be or wanted to be. She thought being a professor's wife was the pinnacle of achievement. But once she found herself there, she determined to use her position to do good. She'd been interested in social work ever since she was a student in an art school in New York. 
And so she began to look around for a project in Washington, D.C. And she discovered that behind the Capitol building there was a maze of alleyways. They were dark and dirty. They bred crime and disease. And Ellen wanted those buildings torn down and replaced with modern hygienic ones. At that time, the District of Columbia was run by the federal government. So Ellen took a White House car and began to drive the congressmen through those <laughs> alleys to show them the squalor that existed right behind the marble halls of the Capitol building. As far as I know, she was the first First Lady to campaign for a cause that was not her husband's outside of the White House. However, during Woodrow's second year in office, her health began to suffer. She had kidney disease, and she had to give up her activities. By June of 1914, she could no longer get out of bed. June of 1914 saw the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria, and soon the world was at war. By August 6th, Ellen was dying. She realized she was running out of time, so she asked her husband's chief of staff to go up to Capitol Hill and tell the members of Congress she would die more easily if they would just pass an alley bill. <laughs> the Senate took action in time for her to hear about it before she died. The House took action shortly thereafter, but the legislation was never implemented because of the outbreak of World War I. At this point, Ellen's life seemed fairly inconsequential. It would be 20 years before her influence would make itself known. Meanwhile, she'd left a grieving husband. But a year after her death, he married a lively widow, Edith Bowling Galt. She became his partner, too. She worked closely with him during World War I, decoding secret telegrams as they came in from Europe. Together, after the war, they went to Paris, where he negotiated the Paris Peace Treaty of Versailles. And that provided for a League of Nations, something he very much wanted. But he was ahead of his time. The Senate in the United States objected to the League of Nations and refused to ratify it. So Woodrow, with Edith, undertook a grueling train trip across the United States to try to rally support among the American people for the League of Nations. The trip proved too much for him. His health broke down. They sped back to Washington, D.C., but it was too late. He suffered a massive stroke. He was partly paralyzed. He could hardly speak. And nobody knew what his mental faculties were like. As a president, he was completely incapacitated. So Edith Wilson stepped in, and she assumed more power than any First Lady before or since. She instructed his doctors and the White House staff to keep his condition a secret. If his condition had been known, his opponents would have forced him from office. She knew that Woodrow Wilson would not have wanted that, and she always did what he wanted. During the next 18 months, the remainder of his term, Edith decided who would be allowed to see Woodrow Wilson and what issues would be brought before him. But mostly, she just postponed decisions, hoping he would get better and deal with them himself. She was actually implored to take more action for the sake of the country. And she said, I'm not thinking about the country. I'm thinking about my husband. What I realized then was that Edith Wilson was a very traditional wife, although today she has a reputation of being a pathbreaker. I found instead that it was Ellen Wilson who really broke new ground. Let me tell you how. In her husband's administration, there was a young assistant secretary of the Navy. His wife was a tall, shy woman, and she occasionally went to the White House. She knew Ellen Wilson. Her name was Eleanor Roosevelt. In the years after Ellen's death, no other First Lady lobbied for any legislation. But in March 1933, the first thing Eleanor Roosevelt did on entering the White House 
was to go up to Capitol Hill and begin to lobby for another alley bill. <laughs> As you know, she went on to...